So let's take a moment and we'll just do kind of a, a brief meditation, contemplation, prayer, you know, kind of as you feel so moved, but we'll just take a moment and sit in silence and kind of arrive and uh, come together as a group. Sensing your body, and slowly bring your awareness from the inside to the outside. So I want to start off this morning just talking a little bit about you know, what I refer to as the work. Um, it, the, it's, be, it's become a, a word kind of in somewhat popular culture um, to represent uh, kind of the, the, the modern uh, Western interpretation of an age-old lineage. And so the work has become 
word that's been assigned to that. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about you know, what is that and, and why. Uh, because it's what we're going to engage in today. Is we're going to do a little bit of, of the work. Um, so uh, often you know, I, I hear you know, my teachers say, I hear other teachers say, that you know, the work is this um, age-old, unbroken lineage many thousands of years old, as old as humanity. There's this lineage referred to as the work. And I don't know, for a long time I would hear them say that and go, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, kind of somebody trying to stake a claim, mine is better than yours, mine is older than yours, um, something of that nature. And, um, it took quite a while for me to, to see that, that although that may also be true, there is another truth that they're speaking to when they say that. You know, that there is this, uh, this current that runs through humanity that doesn't come in the form of a religion or even a spirituality, but it is, it is something that in each time, in each culture, um, gets made into a form. But that form is based on something on an original current, and that current is what we refer to as the work. And uh, Within the traditions, they, they have uh, four basic ways of kind of looking at um, spirituality, and the work is considered a fourth way way. Um, and it, it has some hallmarks to it, which is one of the definitions of kind of being a fourth way uh, school is that there's no um, the, the, well, typically there's, there's no, uh, say, institution. You know, there isn't a, 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 an enduring from uh, you know, teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher. It isn't a teaching that is passed down the way we think of many lineages that have a, a, a tradition where the what is being taught, how it's being taught, the form is passed along. The nature of a fourth way school is um, it is unique in every arising and unique to the person who is uh, teaching and it is unique to the time and the place and to the students that show up to participate in it. Yeah. So that's one of the hallmarks of the fourth way. Um, and the work in the, in the sense of the work is a fourth way way. Um, uh, so, uh, some things to think about, I mean, what, some, so, some analogies maybe, um, uh, so evolution, right? we can think of evolution as this current in nature, this thing that happens, right? and it isn't uh, necessarily dogmatic, it isn't that somebody decided evolution should go this way, and therefore nature just follows that person's or that institution's conception of how things should go, right? It, it seemingly is a process that came before people and it is continuing on even in the presence of people. Right? So uh, another one might be uh, the survival instinct. Right? So the survival instinct is something that exists in all things that are alive. Right? All things that are alive want to continue being alive. We call that the survival instinct. So from the perspective of the work, we say that there is what, what we call an enlightenment instinct. That just like we have a survival instinct, we have a drive to uh, actualize our potential, to become more. And that drive, that instinct, um, is that current that we refer to as the work. Right? That is alive in each person, but it isn't just alive in you in a way that is completely different than that is alive in every other person who has ever been alive. Right? How you express it, that is personal. But that it's in you, that, again, like the survival instinct, cuts through all of it. So the work is based on that, that current. And for me, uh, one of the forms that embodies that is the yoga tradition. Right? So the, the teachings of the yoga tradition, I don't mean uh, posture, asana practice, right? But I mean the, the entire teaching philosophy of the yoga tradition um, 
as much as it is also part of a religion and a spirituality, it can be taken as a series of how-tos and taken into any tradition and, and work. And, and my feeling is that it's because it is a pretty pure expression of how to touch into and work with the enlightenment instinct. Right? It gives us a, a way to put handles on it and to work with it very intentionally and directly and amplify it in our lives. There are other methods besides the, the yoga tradition, um, but I personally have just settled on that as, as kind of the template or the form that I use to guide um, my own work. And when I'm in this role, kind of sharing with others, that I use as the, the template. Um, and so for that reason, we've been kind of following along uh, the eight limbs of yoga and kind of going through them and how those apply or how we can use those in our kind of modern Western life. You know, they come with, depending on how one encounters them, a, a pretty heavy uh, kind of cultural overlay and a lot, thousands of years of, of interpretation. And they can be misleading in terms of how do I apply that in my life? What does that mean to me? Like the topic we're going to talk about today, brahmacharya. Right? The probably the most common interpretation of this is uh, abstinence from sex. Right? And you can imagine that you say that to most, you know, folks in the modern world, right? Living a, a householder's life. That's not high on anybody's list, you know. I mean, you may have a period in your life where that's just the case, <laughs> but it isn't necessarily something you're doing intentionally, right? You haven't taken it on as a practice. Um, but, you know, today we're going to talk about, you know, how that is absolutely not what brahmacharya means, right? That that is just one of the ways it's been interpreted and talked about, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's attention getting. Some people like the idea, some people are just shocked and appalled by the idea in any ways it's attention getting. Um, the, I think the deeper meaning of it, the, uh, the transformative process behind it is not nearly as provocative and in some ways kind of mundane and, and easy to pass over, right? And see, see the value of it versus saying to somebody, I want you to be, you know, I want you to renounce sex become you know, chaste. That really, you know, can be a challenge and a sense of accomplishment and a lot about that. But uh, what we'll see as we talk about the brahmacharya and what it really is, is that one of the side effects of the practice might be abstinence from sex. Might be. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't mean you're doing it right if it is. It's just to say there's one of the ways that it could show up and traditionally has been seen to show up. But it isn't something that you just do out of will. Like, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna become a renunciate. I'm now a monk. You know? um, it, it's not that at all. It's just more of a natural evolution that that just makes sense. Right? So um, we're gonna talk about that today. You know, I just wanted to, to touch on, um, you know, we've talked, we started off this particular series on with uh, Ahimsa so nonviolence, and we talked a good deal about nonviolence with ourself in our own process and the importance of that. And I want to continue to remind as we engage in the work that we are compassionate with ourself and we don't have too high expectations, that we keep a good eye on our inner critic, otherwise we be, you know, what we call the spiritual superego will take over your practice and, and your spiritual superego has a really big club and will beat you mercilessly with it and your practice, well, you won't practice. You know? Probably the most common reason people stop practicing is because they can't withstand the uh, abuse from their own inner critic. So we want to definitely you know, keep that in mind as we go forward today. We also talked about uh, truthfulness and truth. The idea of truth, that truth is what is. 
a pretty simple definition, right? Without getting too philosophical about it, but the truth is what is. And this is really to kind of get in the way or block all of our woulda, coulda, shoulda, it's not fair, it ought to be kind of activity that takes place and, and, and help bring us to the place of life presents you with a situation and your job is to engage with that you know, as mindfully and compassionately and empathetically as you can and not stay in kind of a self-contracted, self-protective place of it shouldn't be this way, right? It should have been some other way. I should have won the lottery, right? I mean, that, it, 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 I think we can all understand that we do that and, you know, have, again, some empathy for the why of it. Um, but in the end, we, we, you know, if we're going to live our life, we have to meet life where it is. So the need for that truthfulness is our willingness to do that. And we talked about last time um, non-stealing. And in this case, it wasn't really about not taking other people's stuff. Right? It was to, it framed it more in the sense of the present time me not stealing from the future me. And an example of that is you know, do I meditate today? Or do I decide, well, you know, I could get an extra load of laundry in if I skip my meditation. Or I'm going to watch the second half of the first half of what I DVR'd last week. And, you know, I'll meditate later, right? So we do things like that, right? Or I'm going to call my mom, talk to my mom. It would be really good, you know, to do that. I haven't done, I haven't done that in a while. Actually, I, I haven't done that in a while and I should, right? But if I don't do my practice, I'm stealing from the future me, the me who I would be if I practiced my practice when it was time to practice my practice, right? So also we looked at it from stealing from others, right? So there's this uh, kind of essential resource that as human beings we all need, right? And, and we put it in a number of different ways, but today I'll, I'll use the word contact. As human beings, we need contact with other human beings, right? And when we withhold our contact from another human being, right? and that could just simply be, you know, if you're kind of upset with somebody, they walk into the room and you don't look at them, you know, give them the cold shoulder, right there, right? You've stolen from them, right? So that's the side that we looked at. We looked at the... You know, not the material side of it, right? but the subtle, energetic side of it that really isn't so subtle. I mean, we've all felt that hurt that happens when somebody withholds their attention, their affection, right? It, it really hurts. So it's not a small thing. You know, I'd actually rather have you come by my house and steal my tires than, than hold, withhold your attention far more damaging and detrimental. Right? So this, we're going to continue on that same way of kind of looking behind the surface of the teachings to the impact that it really has on the subject that we are, the person, and how we are in the world because of that. Right? So today's topic, uh, brahmacharya. So I think to, to kind of talk about brahmacharya, first maybe we need to, to talk about ideas of God, right? Or true nature, or spirit, or presence, or Buddha nature, or Tao. So many words, right? And even if um, one is an atheist, which we probably don't have too many here, given that this is a church, but it could happen, right? Um, even an atheist believes in something, right? Even if it's the atheism, right? Like what that belief is, if that's what they believe in, you know, that, I, that there's only one life, this is, this is that life, right? That creates a way of being in the world. And that, then that's, in a sense, that's your God. If you're an atheist, atheism is your God, right? That's what you kind of live in accord with. So, you know, using the word God can be kind of charged. You know, sometimes, you know, here in the West, people have 
decided that the Western Church and the idea of a patriarchal God is not so good, and, and so we don't resonate with the word. We need another word. I'm probably one of those people, but we, I need something to say today. So I'll say God. Feel free to translate that to whatever that means for you. And if you find that it, you know, is a little provocative, right? Great. Then that's the ground of the work for you, and it's it's being tilled. So it's a great opportunity um, for the exercises we're going to do in a little bit. Right? So the reason we need some some idea of this, what is more than me? Right? What is more than me? Right? Is brahmacharya is the practice of putting our attention, giving our attention to that. Right? So it's, it's going through our day thinking about God. And not just thinking about God, it's more than that. Right? So we, uh, uh, Meister Eckhart, um, Christian mystic, right? Meister Eckhart said, um, God is Golazen about being God. Right? So Golazen, German word, and kind of the, the, the root word of it, lazen, is kind of like lazy, but not exactly, right? Because lazy in English has a negative connotation to it. Um, but you could say laid back, you know? Like God is laid back about being God. God is not uptight about being God. God is so laid back about being God that God gives God away as reality. So this is part of the mystical understanding in mystical Christianity, Sufism, Hinduism, Buddhism, that that which we've, we've conceived of as God, as God as a separate being someplace, um, is um, kind of reconfigured to, you know, God is reality. You know, I'm God, you're God, you're God, this building is God. When you walk out and there's a sidewalk, that's God, and there are cars, that's God. There's no not God, right? So that's the, that really is perhaps the most instructive mantra, right? There is no not God. Right? Wherever you're thinking or feeling or believing that, like, well, God's not that, right? That is a great place to, to notice only your resistance or your lack of insight of your not yet recognized God in that place yet. Right? So this is a premise. This is a perspective that I'm sharing with you. Right? Not a belief that you have to like, believe and just take, okay, well, he said so. Right? So I either accept it or I reject it. Um, it's, a, it's a perspective that I invite you to to kind of do the work from this perspective and find out. You know, find out if this has any validity. You know? And what's the impact of standing in this perspective? Right? Even if this perspective isn't true at all, but it moves you along the path of the enlightenment instinct. If it allows you to unfold and become more of who you are, then it's helpful. And it really doesn't matter whether or not it's true if it has that effect of it helps you unfold more of your true nature. So we don't want to turn these, this is the problem kind of with religion, right? Is it takes these perspectives and it tries to turn them into solid beliefs that one must live their life under, right? They're immovable, rigid beliefs that dictate what we do and how we do it and why we do it and we don't question them is not all the point of this, right? This is really just grist for the mill. We'll look into it and see. Right? But to practice brahmacharya, you have to have some relationship with that which is more than me. Some concept of that. So that you can then begin the practice, which is how do I build a relationship to that which is more than me? How can I, moment to moment, be perceiving that which is more than me? Right? That's the practice of brahmacharya. Right? So I can say it's, it's moment to moment kind of thinking about God. And that's true in a way, but it's kind of limited. Right? 
I don't want to just think about it. I actually want to perceive, like full body, with all of my being that I'm present to, I want to perceive the presence of the divine in every way, in every moment, through all of my senses and all of the ways that I perceive. I want to perceive that which is divine and rest my attention in that. That's the practice, right? Is that that's what I give my, most of my attention to. Not the other things, not the particulars, not the nuts and bolts, not the, um, you know, I have to get up in the morning and I don't want to, I'm tired. That might be true. And, and you may be aware of that, right? I have to go to work and there's something at work and I don't like this person and I have to work with that person and I don't want to. I had a fight with my partner and I'm going to come home from work and I don't want to, it's going to be uncomfortable, right? Those kinds of things. Those kinds of things still happen and you still have those feelings, right? It's not about not having those feelings. It's that even though you've maybe had a fight with your partner and you're angry and hurt and you don't want to go home because it's going to be uncomfortable and you don't think you can find it within yourself to be forgiving, right? to be spiritual. Right? Here's a place for your spiritual superego to show up. You said you're a spiritual person, so you have to forgive them, you have to go home, and you have to be loving. Right? <laughs> <You> <laughs> Guy said, if you give them the cold shoulder, it will hurt them, and that's not nice, right? So you go home and try and be all sweet and understanding, and, you know, not at all, right? It's not at all. I mean, that's a nice idea. Give it a try. See how it goes, right? But that's not the idea, right? The idea is that you could also see that your partner is divine, and that at the same time you're angry with them because you feel hurt by them, you're also recognizing their divinity, and that you're willing to put more attention on their divinity and not on your hurt. But it doesn't mean you don't have the hurt or that you forget the hurt or that you have to deal with the fact that they did something that hurt you and that that should be as an adult, we should take care of those things and say, you know, you know, when that happened, I really felt hurt. And it would be helpful for me in the future if you wouldn't, you know, or if we could talk about this, right? You still need to do that, right? We're still people. We still have egos and personalities, and we still got to work out the logistics of living and getting along. But there, Brahmacharya calls us to this, don't get mired in those details. Right? Don't go around thinking that you're just a wounded ego who has the right to be hurt and angry and cut somebody off and wait until they say sorry. calls us to recognize the divine in ourself, the divine in the other, the divine in the situation, right? and give that our attention. And in the midst of giving that our attention, to deal with everything else. That's the practice of brahmacharya. Yeah. Not easy. Right? Certainly, it's easy in a neutral situation where you kind of have, you know, no feelings, no particular thoughts about whatever. Um, you know, if you like your car, you might find it easy to start practicing feeling the divinity of your car, right? But in the more difficult situations where there's more emotion and there's more momentum in the, you know, the, the egoity involved, right? It's a lot harder to do that. You know, so don't start there. Don't, don't start with those most difficult situations. Start in the ones that are more benign. You know? Start, if it's with people, with people that today you're liking. <laughs> start with them, you know? Um, if you're like me, sunsets, right? I love sunsets, right? I'm not as fond of sunrises, because I'm not a morning person. And if I'm seeing a sunrise, as delightful as it is, it's a reminder that I'm not in bed sleeping. <laughs> Casts a little bit of gray on it. But I love sunsets. Right? So for me, that's a great place, you know, that if you've ever kind of just been spontaneously, kind of your attention has been captured by the, a sunset and, and, and just awed by the beauty and the majesty and, and the just ordinariness of it, like this happens every day, but those moments, right, you can be like, wow, this happens every day, and you feel the gift of it. 
it's hard to create that strategically. You know? Like, I'm going to drive to the sunset place and I'm going to sit here. You know, it almost never happens. You are almost never suddenly and spontaneously overtaken by awe when you approach it strategically. Yeah? But yet, a practice is, I mean, the very nature of a practice is the strategy of having these experiences. Right? The strategy of kind of the same experience you have maybe with the spontaneous sunset right? is to have that similar experience when you see your neighbor, when you walk out in the morning and there's your neighbor getting into their car and you see them and you see them with the same sense of awe that you have when you see the sunset. It's like you just recognize their inherent beauty. And you're utterly awed by it and you recognize the gift that you've been given by a glimpse of them. Right? How would that be? You know, how would that be to have that be your moment to moment experience? Yeah. So we have to have a practice and we have to have a lot of patience and we need to keep control of our superego because it will tell us how bad we are at this because it's not happening. And it, we should just, you know, eat cookies and watch TV give it up. But we want to understand it is difficult, but it is possible. We know it's possible because millions upon millions of people who came before us have accomplished it. Right? Bit by bit, day by day, in the practice, we can all accomplish this in a small way or a large way. But even in a small way, it will utterly change the foundation of how you are in this world. I mean, that's how significant it is. Even if you have one genuine moment of the spontaneous practice of brahmacharya, it will change how you are in this world. Because it will open the door to the possibility. It will become real to you. Undeniably, undoubtedly, nobody could ever talk you out of it again. You will begin, you will know that the divine nature is ever-present and perceivable. So we practice for that one moment. And then that one moment becomes what fuels our practice. So we're going to do some exercises today to kind of look into this. You know, what about this brahmacharya thing? Right? So we're going to do um, two exercises. The first one is going to be a monologue, right? which means you're going to get in a group of three. And if there's an odd number, I'm happy to be a third person in a group. Um, uh, I will give you uh, a set time. You'll have a time. The, the exercise will literally be timed, and you'll have, let's say, three minutes. For three minutes, you're just going to talk, right? Or not talk. It's your choice, right? It's your time. It's your three minutes. Use it as you please. The opportunity is for you to explore in a felt sense way, present to the truth. And again, the truth is what is in the moment. So present to yourself as the arising truth, you're going to explore this idea of God. What is your relationship with God? Look into that. How's that been for you? What is it currently? You know, where are you at in your relationship to God? And again, feel free to fill in something that works for you other than God. I mean, you can talk about God in terms of the Christian God that we've all had in our enculturation. But you can talk, also talk about your true nature, your spirit, your soul. What is that? That thing that is more than you. What is your relationship with that? Right? How has that gone for you through your life? And then also, kind of intermixed, same time, exploring this question of, you know, what do you think about this idea of, of opening up to and trying to have a felt sense, the immediacy of your experience is informed by the divine nature of whatever your attention is attending to. You know? That your senses could register divinity you know, as well as your eyes register color. You know? Your ears can register sound waves. You know? If your senses could register divinity. How would that be? Does it seem like a good idea, a bad idea? You like it, you don't like it? 
this seems silly, whatever it is, but to explore that, right? So when you do these exercises, um, it's, it's, uh, you want to open up to not just your thinking mind, not just the verbal mind that thinks thoughts, right? Kind of left brain, analytical, linguistic, logical, not just that, right? That's one of your senses. Do you want to open up to all of your senses? So you're hearing and you're seeing and you're tasting and you're feeling both on the outside feeling, right? Temperature, for example. But you're inside, like your organs, right? The, the largest amount of information that flows into our brain, right, is from our body. Right? And this is an amazing truth about us. More than our seeing or our hearing or our smelling is the amount of information that is flowing up from our body. Right? So we want to tap into that, like open up, you know, like be willing to feel, like what does your liver have to say? What does your kidneys have to say? What do your intestines have to say? Your heart, your lungs, your legs, your knees, your ankles, right? So open to feeling the bodily sensations, even if you don't know what they mean. It doesn't matter. It'll come, right? You'll learn to speak that language in time. But in your monologue, you might just say, like, as I'm talking, I feel this clenching in my belly. And you just acknowledge it. You just bring it into the part of the truth of what is in the moment. You don't have to say anymore. It doesn't have to have a meaning or an implication. But all we're doing in the monologue is kind of codifying our experience. We're giving language to our experience. And, and that, that has a value can't really get into the why of it right now. It's too long of a conversation. But codifying our experience has a value in this process of the work. Right? So in the monologue, there's a group of three. The other two people are silent witnesses. You're just sitting, holding space. You minimize the social engagement. So if you're talking, I'm like, You know, there's none of that, right? Because <laughs> I'm not trying to elicit the other person's social uh, personality, right? I want them to stay with themselves and what is arising in them, right? So we're just, you're present. You're sensing your body. You're being present. You're listening, but you're not trying to become involved in their story, right? What they're saying, the details of it, they're not telling you a story that you're becoming involved in. You're witnessing the unfolding of them. So that's your attitude, that you're there as a witness to the unfolding of this person. Just be simple about it. Right? The, the teaching teaches itself in the doing of it. Right? You just, we're just sensitive to the exercises. The wisdom in them comes forward, and you see, and you're like, oh, that's why we do it this way. Right? So the person doing the monologue, this isn't... A, like, all of a sudden you have to tell, like, your deepest, darkest secrets, right? Not at all. It's just what's arising in you now that may have something to do with the question. It may have nothing to do with the question. It doesn't matter. That's the gift of it. It's your time to be present with yourself, right? And if you want, you can take the question, as I laid it out, an inquiry into your relationship with God and the practice of brahmacharya, and make that kind of the guiding intention of your inquiry. But more important than doing the assignment right and saying something intelligent about your relationship to God is that you're true to yourself and you're present to your experience. So we're going to do that exercise. And then, uh, then after that, we're going to break up into groups of two. Right? So the groups of three will very quickly this band will break up into groups of two, and I'll give you the next assignment at that point. So we're going to do two uh, exercises. I'm going to time them, so you don't have to worry about that. I'll let you know when to start and when to stop, and we'll keep kind of social commentary to a minimum so that we can really allow each person to kind of be in their space and be present to themselves and, again, not have to feel socially engaged. So uh, we have plenty of space if you want to just grab three people, take three chairs, turn them facing each other, and we'll get started. And once you get settled, I'll give you your, the time for each person.
Go. 